I'm Courtney Professor in the Humanities here at OSU, and um, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Horning for endowing the uh, Horning Professorships, and um, which has allowed us to bring lots of people in and do lots of programming, do lots of wonderful lectures. And I'm uh, particularly happy to welcome Robert Fox as this year's Horning Visiting Scholar, who will be giving three lectures this week. Today on Wednesday at this time in this room and on Friday in this room at noon. So not at four on Friday, but at noon. Um, I've known Robert for 25 years, I think. Yes. Um, I first met him at La Villette in Paris a long time ago, in the late 80s. Uh, Robert has had an extremely distinguished career, and I'm not going to enumerate all of his honors and books because we would be here until five just doing that. But um, he was, um, for many years, a professor of the history of science at the University of Lancaster in England, and then moved on to uh, direct the uh, Centre de Recherche en Histoire des Sciences et des Techniques at the Cité des Sciences at La Villette for two years in Paris, and then moved to Oxford as the professor of the history of science at Oxford University, um, a position he held for 18 years. And um, he hasn't been inactive in his retirement, to say the least, so he's published uh, at least one book this past year and has edited many. He is also the editor of the journal uh, Notes and Records of the Royal Society. Uh, he's won many prizes, um, and among his books are The Culture of Science in France from 1700 to 1900, um, in Science Industry in the Social Order in Post-Revolutionary France. Yeah, I want to say pre-revolutionary, but that's <laughs> my period. Um, and most recently, just out from Johns Hopkins, The Savant in the State, Science and Cultural Politics in 19th Century France. Uh, this week, he's going to be giving three talks on the theme of science international universalism and national interest in the industrial age. Today he'll be talking about mapping the universe of knowledge. On Wednesday he'll be talking about the age of exhibitions. And Friday at noon he'll talk about the legacy of a fractured world, in the post-war world. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Robert. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and to see familiar faces in the audience. And of course I have to I want to add my thanks to Dr. Horning for making this possible. Well, I'm going to be talking about internationalism in science. And I'd say that essentially these lectures are about dialogue and often about tensions. Dialogue or tensions between ideals and realities. And on the one hand, what I call universalist ideals. And these are ideals about science, about the world of knowledge, about what I'm going to call the universe of knowledge, which really descend from the old idea of a seamless, undivided republic of letters, on the one hand. On the other hand, the very messy realities of implementation and action. Now, most of what I'll say today and later in the week will be about the 100 years or so from the mid-19th century to the mid-20th century. And I chose that period because I feel that in those years, universalist aspirations had a special force. They were expressed with particular vehemence and I think with particular optimism. But those same years, that same century, was also a period in which universalism was dealt its cruelest, some of its cruelest blows by war, politics, and as I'll be arguing, I think the general ascendancy, the general victory of uh, com com competition, of conflict, of self-interest over cooperation and the wider public good. Now the specific ideal I want to talk about in this lecture is a key facet of universalism and that is the dream that knowledge, all knowledge, scientific, whatever, that all knowledge would one day be available to everyone, available and easily accessible. Now of course it's an old dream and it's an elusive dream and it's a dream that's really been with us for as long as we've tried as human beings to assemble knowledge, to accumulate knowledge, 
And for as long as, as human beings, we've tried to order what we know. And the problem, and here I'm referring to the title of uh, Anne Blair's book of two or three years ago, the problem is that there's always been too much to know. Uh, that was true long before the invention of printing. This is the theme of Anne Blair's book. Um, but there's no doubt that printing exacerbated things, exacerbated the problem. So, no wonder there were symptoms of what Anne Blair calls information overload already in the 16th and 17th centuries. And no wonder, I think, that people were already agonising about how to organise knowledge and how to retrieve knowledge once we'd got it. You see, it was all very well for somebody like this, Theodore de Mayenne, well-travelled, wealthy, prodigiously learned, physician to the kings of France, the kings of England. It was all very well for somebody like Mayenne to take as his motto, patet omnibus veritas, in the sense, of course, truth did lie open to all. It was there to be had. The problem was, how did you get at it? But by Mayenne's time, we're talking here the early 17th century, by Mayenne's time, the sheer volume of what was now overwhelmingly printed material the sheer volume was making access to truth difficult. I mean, I think I can convey the magnitude of the problem, the dilemma, uh, by a very simple statistic. If you take the number of incunabula, now these are the books printed in the first half century or so of printing, from the middle of the 15th century through to 1500, we're looking at perhaps 30,000 items in all. That would include uh, new editions, reissues of classic texts. It doesn't imply uh, profoundly new works, but 30,000 published works. By Mayan's day, that's 100 years later, so around about 1600, those 30,000 titles have become 300,000, and they were, the number was visibly still growing and growing dramatically. And the problem was recognised. Librarians, libraries, knew they had to take the matter in hand, and they did, as they did at the newly founded state-of-the-art library at the University of Leiden, opened in Holland, opened in 1595. This is managed in a very traditional medieval way, the manner of a medieval library. So you have rows of shelves, and each um, row would have the subject area of books on that row marked, as you can see, you have philosophy, history, medicine, and so on. But there was one innovation in the Leiden Library, and that was the addition of the first printed catalogue of books that we know about. And I think this is a sign that things were really getting serious. <laughs> By 1600, even in a well-kept library like Leiden, even in the new Bodleian Library in Oxford, which was founded at about the same time, another impediment was already beginning to loom, and that was language. Now, initially, this hadn't been a grave problem. If you look again at the languages of the Incunabula, that's the, remember, these are the, the books published in the first half century or so of printing, up to 1500, then you have 70% of those books in Latin, German following, Italian and French making a fair showing, but other languages, including poor old English, really nowhere at all. 70% in Latin, in, uh, in, these are the books published up to 1500. Take the books then published up to 1600, and that 70% has fallen to 50%. And now, by 1600, you find more and more scholars uh, practicing two linguistic registers. They would have Latin, which they would master and write in easily, but also a vernacular. An example I want to choose is Thomas Harriot, the English mathematician, polymath Thomas Harriot. And he was typical in having these two languages, this, this, this bilingualism, if you like. Now, Harriot was an Oxford graduate. He was very steeped in the ancient languages, ancient philosophy, ancient learning, and yet he wrote his, uh, probably I suppose his most famous book, The Brief and True Report of the Newfound Land of Virginia, uh, dated 1588. He wrote it in English. It's the first 
book-length account of America in English. It was written following Harriet's uh, voyage, or his participation in the voyage, financed by Walter Raleigh, but not accompanied by Walter Raleigh, because the Queen never wanted Raleigh to be out of her sight. But um, Harriet accompanied the voyage, which was financed by Raleigh in 1585, to what we now call North Carolina. And then the book is an account, really, of the coastal area of North Carolina. That comes out in English, but when, two years later, the book is reissued, uh, this time with the magnificent illustrations of John White, who was also on that voyage, Harriet chose to write his commentary on the illustrations in Latin, and his Latin was then translated into English for the English edition. He didn't write it in English. And I think there are many later examples of this linguistic versatility. I mean, you've... The, the, the most obvious example a century later would be Isaac Newton, for example, equally at home in Latin or in English, Latin for the Principia and English for the other, his other great book, The Optics. But by Newton's day, there's no doubt that Latin was in retreat as a universal language. We know that the Royal Society in London by the late 17th century was having to translate quite a number of articles that were submitted to it in Latin into English simply because the fellows didn't read Latin well enough to understand the articles. And on through the 18th century, uh, new <coughs> modern-minded academies, scientific societies, actually displayed their modernity by avoiding the use of Latin. I mean, you can't imagine the new American philosophical society in the 18th century choosing to use Latin. I mean, that would have sent out a very odd message, I think. Um, and really, the only major academy that's still using Latin by the end of the 18th century is the St. Petersburg Academy, uh, which only abandoned its Latin name and stopped publishing its papers in, uh, in Latin in 1803. But St. Petersburg Academy was very much an outlier. And I think you'd have to say that by the beginning of the 19th century, science and the world of learning generally, science was without a universal language as a means of communication. And along the way, of course, the old bugbear, the sheer volume of scientific publication, never went away. Remember there were 300,000 titles published by 1600? Well, the 300,000 had grown to an accumulated number of 3 million, by 1800, 9 million by 1900, and it was set on the exponential curve that, of course, has left us in our own day with an accumulated number of books of probably 130 million. And there was a similar growth in periodicals, journals as well. Uh, the historian Derek Price, uh, many years ago now, uh, observed that round about, say, 1750, middle of the 18th century, there were something like 10 journals that you class as scientific or learned journals, but that thereafter, the number of scientific and learned journals increased uh, every 50 years tenfold. So you've got, again, this huge rising curve of journals, which by 1830 was getting so serious, again, the, the problem is constantly being <coughs> recognised that the abstracting journals began. That was the first abstracting journal. It was a journal, abstracting journal in chemistry, in German, and it was covering chemistry. That was in 1830. But if you look at the number of abstracting journals, that also has followed the upward curve. And of course, the reason it was following an upward curve was that the scientists wanted to actually publish in these journals. Otherwise, they'd have died. If you take William Thomson, later Lord Kelvin, in his 60-year career, beginning in the 1840s, he published um, 700 papers. Now, that works out at about one a month. You know, it wasn't rubbish. Um, and that's to say nothing of his books and his uh, lectures. And Derek Price actually found another, even more prolific um, scientist, a little bit later, Professor of Natural History at the University of Colorado, who published nearly 4,000 papers in 66 years, which is one a week. Um, you know, that takes, takes some doing. Um, well, in those circumstances, in this sea, this rising tide of print, you know, what did it mean to say the truth lay open to all? 
Well, um, I think you'd have to say that just because of quantity, clearly truth didn't lie open to all. But the question then is who cared? Who cared if knowledge was spiraling out of control? Uh, why didn't you just assimilate the, the small corner of knowledge, of the universe of knowledge that you're particularly interested in, and then apply it as you, as you felt fit in your, in your own home patch? and leave it at that. Well, I don't think you get away with that in the later 19th century. I think the problem did matter because science itself was changing. It was becoming, by the later 19th century, much more, conspicuously more international. There were a number of grand projects. I suppose the grandest of all and the best of all is the Carte du Ciel, the Map of the Sky project launched in 1887 in France. And this was a, a plan to record photographically all the stars down to um, pretty uh, sort of tiny magnitude, the, the, all the stars, uh, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, and to create a sort of inventory of the heavens in that way. That was the Carte du Ciel project. Well, it was one of these universalist projects, and like most universalist projects, it ended in failure. I mean, there were a few years of success, and then gradually, particularly after the First World War, it just sort of petered out. Um, but it, it, I think the internationalism wasn't just a case of these grand projects like the Carte du Ciel. Also, what you might call everyday science was becoming much more uh, international. If you take geodesy, for example, the, the study of the Earth's magnetic field, the Earth's gravitational pull, that sort of thing, or you take meteorology. These are two new sciences that really assert themselves uh, from the middle of the 19th century onwards. And those two sciences make no sense at all if they're just done within particular national boundaries. Uh, you needed to be sure that a reading would mean the same to the observer, an observation would mean the same to the observer, and to the person receiving the information in a letter or reading about it in a learned article. And really similarly, in chemistry, botany, zoology, for the same reason, nomenclature had to be got right. You had to know that you were talking about, everyone was talking about the same thing. And I think late 19th century science, and this is another dimension of the same thing, was moving inexorably towards standardization, precision, accuracy. Um, you had to be sure if you were engaged in telegraphy, for example, you had to be sure that the measurement that you were making of, uh, I don't know, resistance or something like that in ohms was the same, at least that the ohm meant the same for everybody who was reading about your observations. Well, you can see the, 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 the nature of the problem, and I think it's very manifest in the later 19th century that this, is, this change in science is occurring. And I think one uh, indicator of that is the growth of a very new phenomenon in the 19th century, and that is the International Congress. If you look at the 1840s, this rather smudgy diagram I've got, if you look at the 1840s, there were, in that whole decade, nine international congresses of science. If you look at the decade before the First World War, which is the last one there, there are 1,100. This is a totally new phenomenon, and I think it's another indicator of the internationalization of science in this period, just before the first, half century or so before the First World War. Now, there was more to this internationalization than the hard necessity, the needs of science, the practical needs, important, of course, though they were. Internationalism was in the air as an ideal, and in the air, I think, with an intensity that it's not easy to appreciate for us in the 21st century, because we have to look back at the period through the a century or more of world wars, of the Cold War, of other wars, through, in fact, a legacy of everything that's the antithesis of, inter of universalism. But go back earlier. Try to jump over that. Go back earlier to the period just before the First World War, the late 19th century, the very early years of the 20th century, and you get 
find yourself in a, a period of routinely buoyant rhetoric about a real hope, I think, for a release from war and oppression and misunderstanding. And with remarkable regularity, this is why I think it's of special interest for historians of science, with remarkable regularity at the heart of that rhetoric and embodying everything that was most hopeful and most symbolic of peace and international harmony was science. Now even in the relatively favourable climate of the late 19th century, universalist thinking called for visionaries, and it had them in this period in abundance. There was an international network of them, but I'll just dwell on two in particular. Paul Otley, and, well, I might as well immediately introduce the second one, Henri Lafontaine. I'll go back to Otley. They were both Belgian lawyers, they were both committed internationalists, and they were both tireless workers for peace. Otley was the more retiring of the two, he was the technician, if you like, he was the bibliographer, the cataloguer, he's the backroom boy. La Fontaine, more urbane, more of a public figure, more of a celebrity. La Fontaine, in fact, went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1913, and he was a member of the Belgian delegation to the Peace Conference in Paris in 1919, and then the Belgian delegation to the League of Nations Assembly. So he was a very high-profile figure. So different profiles, different personalities, but what... Otley and La Fontaine profoundly shared, I think, was a conviction that universal worldwide access to the sum of human knowledge was the key, was the essential building block, an essential precondition for world peace and human improvement. So when Otley and La Fontaine organised one of those international congresses, the first international congress of bibliography in Brussels in 1895, they were looking far beyond the immediate practical concerns of librarians, the business of the, the, the call numbers, the three by five record cards and so on. They saw those things as tools, they saw those things as useful, but they were means to a far higher end. And yet, as I say, those three by five cards were essential. <laughs> oh, nostalgia. <laughs> well, it gets worse because... Oh, oh bring back... <laughs> oh, someone scan those quick. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can actually even go to see them. <laughs> because they are Otley's cards and his cabinets. These were specially made and designed by him. They've got, you know, they've got draw, um, shelves that pull out here so you can put your books on and so on. They're absolutely perfect. And they are lovingly preserved uh, in a Paul Otley museum in Mons, in the uh, town of Mons in Belgium. It's called the, well, the Paul Otley Museum or the Mundaneum. Well, the cards and cabinets, they're familiar enough. As for the call numbers which uh, Otley used, well, he followed the Dewey uh, decimal system. This is the system that Melville Dewey, American librarian, had refined just a few years earlier in a succession of libraries, mainly at Amherst, but later at Columbia, New York State Library. And this was um, Otley's starting point. His Call numbers, though, were more elaborate. They were longer and more detailed. This is how he, he showed it. Um, remember, you've got the, the ten categories, the Dewey Decimal, ten categories of knowledge. But suppose you've got something in category three, which is social sciences, where you could imagine, you could just imagine then wanting to refine, this is Otley, uh, this is Otley's system, you imagine wanting to refine it into saying, well, it's the social sciences to do with, uh, say, a particular region, Europe or something, and that would give you uh, an extra number, and then you could have, maybe it would be 3-6, and then there'd be a choice of 3-6-1 through to 3-6-9, and you could go on and on and on. 
and Otley's uh, genius, if you like, but I think in the end his failing, because it got so complicated, was that there could be no limit, uh, and that everything could be absolutely um, defined by its number down to the, uh, the, the last detail. You take a, a case here. Uh, this is, uh, you show, this, this is the shelf mark that we're working towards, okay? So we start with seven, which is beaux-arts, so art if you like. We then go on to the second category, which is its relationship to other uh, areas of knowledge, literature, so you get an eight. Then you need to know where it is, um, what, what, it, what it is concerned with, and in that case it is France, which is 44. Then you can go on to the period, it could be any period you see, and 17 is the 18th century, so you go to 17. You then go on to the format, it was the conference, so it was, a, it was a lecture, which is category 04. And then, blow me, it's in Italian, and it gets a 5. And you go on and on like that. Well, you know, you've got to be a glutton for bibliography to want to get engaged in that sort of thing. Um, and actually it got worse than that because um, his, what he wanted to catalogue were not just books and articles, I mean that was you know, what he did on a Sunday afternoon, that was, that was easy. He wanted to catalogue photographs, engravings, lantern slides, book illustrations, microfilms, which he, he discovered. I mean, he didn't discover them, but he, you know, he became conscious of them. Because Otley's aim, after all, was to order, to classify the world. That's what he wanted to do. Knowledge of every possible kind, in every possible format. Uh, and he un understood very clearly that formats, media, if you like, they were changing. It's not just the book, the article. It's not just the printed page anymore. Well, it was a huge undertaking. It had a staff, this is a picture of the, his Bibliographical Institute. It had a staff of 23. This is his uh, Bibliographical Institute in Brussels. Half a million cards had been processed by the end of the first year, 1895. 11 million cards by 1914. And they were getting through about 2,000 cards a day. Well, you can see the magnitude of the task in another context, namely the Library of Congress. This is the card room of the Library of Congress in the 1920s. And you can just see this is a pretty formidable undertaking. Um, and it wasn't only a question of cataloguing, because Otley's Institute also answered queries. So you could ask for a bibliography about any subject under the sun. And of course, with this system, he was able to get at the information pretty quickly. Um, and the Brussels office would supply it when it received a, a, a request for information on bibliography, it would supply it. And the idea was that in due course, uh, copies of the cards in Brussels would be duplicated in major cities elsewhere. Washington, Paris, Rio were all talked about. And so you set up a sort of world network of satellite depositories and information services. But Brussels would be the, the, the centre, if you like, of the spider's web. That's where the master bibliography would be. Uh, but it would, there would be these subsidiary satellite bibliography centres as well. Uh, it was supported, I'm talking just before the First World War, it was well supported by the King of Belgium, it's well supported by the Belgian government, who wanted to see Brussels in particular but emerge, I mean, Belgium generally, but I'd say Brussels to emerge as a world city, as a city that somehow would stand above the strife that, you know, that affected Paris and Berlin and London and so on and so forth. Well, it would be hard to imagine a more ambitious project, even if it had just been a bibliographical project, but it was much more than that. Uh, there was more to it than bibliography. Uh, there was that higher vision of a world united by knowledge. United in knowledge. And I think that, that dream, that higher vision, fired many, many auxiliary projects. True universalism, for example, implied unimpeded communication orally and, and on in, in writing. 
uh, we're in a time, and again it's significant about the period, we're in a time when universal languages are beginning to proliferate. At the time when Otley and uh, La Fontaine were thinking about this problem, they were uneasy about choosing any existing language. I mean, the natural one for the sciences would actually have been German. If you look at the sheer volume of stuff that's published in German, that German is clearly in the lead in the years just before the First World War, especially in chemistry, especially in ancient history, archaeology, but in other areas as well. But, you know, you're, not, you're going to have difficulty asking them to opt for German. Um, uh, they would have preferred French, I'm sure, but then that would have caused problems as well. Um, so, true universalism, as they, conceded, as they conceived it, needed a new language. It needed a language which was unattached to the existing languages. And it's a sign uh, of the universalist spirit of the time, as I say, that at least two choices were available. One was Volapuk and one was Esperanto. The other uh, quite strong runner in later years was Ido, which was only uh, invented in 1907. So, uh, Otley and La Fontaine uh, had two, to, essentially two to choose from. They chose Esperanto, um, and Esperanto had only been, it was the latest thing, it had only been launched a few years before by Ludwig Zamenhof, who was a, a Polish eye doctor of all things, and uh, he was another person in this international network of committed supporters of the pacifist ideal, peace, understanding and so on. Um, Esperanto has a very simplified grammar, that was one of its, and still is of course, uh, one of its attractions. Uh, I wanted to show you this, uh, this illustration partly to show you that they had international congresses of, it, of uh, Esperanto, but also to show that I actually know a bit of Esperanto, namely that Congress, Congresso, is Congress, of course, but it, it has an O at the end because all nouns have O's at the end. <laughs> and then I also know that Internaciona, Internacion, and Internacia, uh, is um, an adjective because all adjectives have an A at the end. That is about, that pretty well exhausts. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the important thing is not that whether we speak it or not. I mean, one has to say that Otley and La Fontaine never spoke it. They never learnt it. But Esperanto entered into their programme. It was part and parcel of what they were trying to promote. So you have a universal language, you have a universal bibliography, and Otley and La Fontaine even made a start on a universal museum. And this was going to be a museum that would include a represent, it couldn't include everything in the world obviously, but it would include a representative display of artifacts, human uh, creations from everywhere in the world. And they would be arranged in rooms and catalogued according to the bibliographical decimal system. I mean, you would know where to go for Javanese pocket knives. <laughs> because there would be a code for that. Um, and most ambitious of all, there was to be an international city. There was to be a world city founded on the principle of peace and with knowledge as, and science in particular, as, it, as the glue of humanity. And here, Otley and La Fontaine found their perfect universalist partner in Hendrik Christian Andersen. Now, Anderson was a Norwegian-American artist, architect, city planner, resident of Rome, an aesthete in every sense, intimate friend of Henry James. And his aim was to give internationalism, universalism, a physical expression, a place. Now, in Anderson's ideal city, it was to be... Um, an international world centre, this is how he described it when he announced it in 1912, just before the First World War. Harmony and peace were the overriding objectives and everything was planned to help humanity on the road to perfection, a perfection that would of course be uh, defined by peace, understanding, human, good human relations and so on. The 
This is a, a sort of imaginary uh, aerial view of the city. Uh, the spine, if you like, of the city was this long avenue going uh, diagonally from lower right to upper left. And this was the avenue of the nations. And it was to be lined with embassies, national cultural centers. And I think it's interesting to see that they don't actually exclude, this plan doesn't exclude the idea of there being nations. But of course, what it does exclude is the idea that nations become the focus for conflict and rivalry. Uh, there were to be, in this ideal city, the International World Center, there were to be uh, residential areas, um, half a dozen of those, each for about 100,000 people. So it's adding up to a city of getting on for a million people. These, then this would be ideal accommodation, high quality accommodation, as, as, uh, uh, as, as the plan insisted. You know, there's not just for rulers, not just for the favoured, but for all citizens. This was a city for the people. There were to be stadiums for sport. There were to be uh, a huge swimming pool, uh, an equestrian centre, an arena for equestrian events and races. There was to be a permanent home for the Olympic Games. The modern Olympic Games having been founded, have been resurrected in Athens in 1896. And Anderson's uh, notion of perfection embraced the physical, the moral, I think, as well as the intellectual. And I think that's something you have to take into account when you look at his, his ideas. Well, to come back to that universal universe of knowledge idea, everything in this city was to be centred on shared understanding. And his city would be, as the title page of his book had it, a world centre of communication. And in that spirit, there'd be monumental buildings for international congresses, there'd be an international court of justice, there'd be uh, an international bank, an international reference library, uh, a temple of religions. Now that was delicate. Um, and certainly what Anderson insists is that although all religions should be represented in the temple of religions, what they should be seeking was not the differences between them, but of course the common ground, the common denominator that was present in all religions. That's what the temple of religions was meant to achieve. And most importantly, there was to be a temple of science a meeting place for scientific congresses, for informal gatherings, and the offices for the international bodies that were governing the various disciplines worldwide by this time. And I say most importantly in talking about this because of science's special status. Now Anderson, of course, was no uh, scientist, but he has this perception of science's special status. It is the power of science, he says. It's the power of science to purify the world, to exterminate destructive germs from every nerve and fibre, to give strength and precision to all mental and physical efforts. And so you've got science seen here so often, and again here, as the form of knowledge that quintessentially transcends boundaries and strife. And at the heart of the whole project, would be the Tower of Progress. 320 metres high, taller than the Eiffel Tower, it had to be, of course, and in it there was to be an international news bureau. I mean, this is, again, this idea about communication, spreading knowledge. There were going to be facilities for wireless telegraphy, facilities for publishing newspapers, journals. Um, and again, you see this emphasis on the spreading of knowledge, the opening up of knowledge, which was absolutely fundamental, I think. And here, another picture of the Tower of Progress. Well, it was a wonderful dream, but dreams need realisation, and Anderson actually was no slouch on that front either. At unimaginable cost, he sent sumptuously bound copies of his huge book. I mean, it is a huge book like this, the project. Beautifully bound in leather to all major libraries. And really sumptuous is the word. A copy did come on the market recently in London, and it sold for $10,000. Uh, 
uh, from an estimate of $1,000. It was sent to, not only to major libraries, heads of government, that sort of thing, it was sent to chosen individuals as well. Each copy would be personally inscribed by Anderson, which is an indication it wasn't perhaps a bestseller, but at least he wrote, uh, these, these inscriptions are interesting, and if you find copies, you can, uh, you, there would be a sort of interesting exercise to see how he addresses, well, first of all, how he chooses the people to whom to, to send a copy, and then how he addresses them. This is the inscription to uh, Arthur Henderson. Arthur Henderson was a trade unionist in England, Labour Party politician, later was foreign minister, and the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. And, of course, that's where... Uh, the common ground is struck. Uh, da, 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 da. An instrument of God, which is interesting. Anderson, profoundly religious, but always in this non-denominational, non-divisive way that I mentioned already. Then, of course, you needed a site. Where are you going to put the city? Well, it ideally should be on the sea because that facilitated communication and uh, various options were discussed. He thought about Constantinople, perhaps on the French Riviera, uh, perhaps Holland, near the Hague, perhaps Rome, and perhaps even in America, on the Jersey Shore. <laughs> in, uh, uh, Ocean County, New Jersey, 30, 40 miles east of Trenton. <laughs> well, the New York Times, and that's the New York Times headline, seems to have thought it was pretty well a done deal. Um, the utopian metropolis, as it calls it, might be destined for this rather swampy land uh, near Lakewood Township. Well, I don't need to tell you that it never happened. Uh, how could it happen? This book was published in 1913, war follows the fo in 1914, and then after the war, economic crisis, a resurgence of nationalist sentiment, all sorts of factors dogged the interwar period and made this scheme totally unrealisable. And I think the tide, in many ways, had turned. Anderson, though, remained loyal to his dream. He was still sending out copies of his book in the 1930s, but of course to no effect. So what about the other dreams? The dreams of Otley and La Fontaine? Well, for a while those lived on. As soon as the war ended, Otley even launched a new scheme, this time for an international university. And the idea was that professors from uh, the world's elite institutions would come to this institution and teach and the university would deliver credits which could be then cashed in uh, back in the in, in any other universities I suppose but in the, uh, the sort of originating university was the, was the idea but that scheme came to nothing the bibliographical project the International Museum well they died more slowly in the post-war chaos Otley managed to find new, this is the museum incidentally, a rather sort of sad place I feel, but these are a couple of rooms. This was the, um, the section on telegraphy as you can see, and every conceivable telegraphic machine was on display, no doubt with its number. Uh, here <laughs> was the section on aviation and they would also have their numbers and so on. So this is uh, the new installation of the, of the international, of the work of this museum after the war. And here you can see Otley in the middle with La Fontaine on the right, standing outside the new premises which he called the Palais Mondial or the Mundaneum, this world palace. So he managed to find new premises in Brussels. Um, the Belgian government though was no longer committed to the project. Um, and I think the reason is that neutrality, after all, for Belgium had meant nothing when push came to shove. I mean, when the Germans wanted to invade uh, Belgium, uh, they just invaded Belgium, whether Belgium was declared neutral or not. And I think there was a disillusionment with this idea that Belgium should, Belgium should become a sort of uh, protected neutral uh, territory. 
there were also anxieties, particularly among the Belgian elites, particularly among with the king and with uh, many people in the government, about La Fontaine's participation in Freemasonry and in international socialist movements. Anyway, the state funding dwindled. La Fontaine did what he could. He gave all his Nobel Prize money for, to support Otley's bibliographical enterprise, but the staff was reduced from 23 to 7. In 1934, uh, Otley and La Fontaine attended the International Bibliographical Congress in Brussels, but it was in that same year, 1934, that Otley finally closed this bibliographical institute and it is sadly also the year in which he died. The museum, well that limped along until Belgium was occupied yet again by German forces and the occupying forces <coughs> cleared out the museum, all this junk in the museum, and they replaced it with, of all things, an exhibition of Nazi art. It was, I mean, you couldn't imagine a more poignant, humiliating end to an internationalist project. Well, where has it all gone wrong? Well, I've mentioned some explanations. I think the financial <coughs> difficulties of the 1920s, La Fontaine Socialist and Masonic Associations. I think there were various resurgence nation nationalisms in the interwar period. And I think there, perhaps there were even limits to Otley's internationalism. Uh, he was a man of the world, of course he was, I and mean, that's, that's visible, but he was also profoundly Belgian. And when he launched his international university in 1920, he stipulated that the only languages in the university should be French or English. Um, in other words, no German. Uh, and, and, you know, as a Belgian patriot, he could just never forgive Germany for what it had done to his country. So was the grand internationalist scheme just a, a fleeting, fanciful pipe dream that's left no legacy? Is it just a project that collapsed under unrealistic ambitions and aspirations? And of course, if it was that irrelevant, what, is it totally for us without historical significance? Well, first on significance, as I said, I'd certainly want to see it what happened, the whole project, as part of an international, internationalist tide that gathered shortly before the First World War. And uh, I'd see its eventual failure as part of a general post-war abandonment of that whole vision of internationalism and universalism. The, the pointers, I think the indicators are there all over the place. Esperanto, for example, went into steep decline from which it's never recovered, I think it's true to say. I mean, it still exists, of course. There are, um, I think, about a thousand, it's thought there are about a thousand people in the world with Esperanto as a native language. Not many. 10,000 are fluent, and it's estimated that a million will have a passing knowledge of Esperanto. Edo is down, apparently down to between 100 and 200 users. So it's, um, these, these universal languages are disappearing I've heard, you know, effectively. Well, I, I'm sure there's an Esperanto, a fluent Esperanto speaker in the audience, so I'd better not pursue that thought. <laughs> but you can see the drift of where I'm trying to go. <laughs> well, on legacy, well, there's been a significant secondary literature on Otley in recent years, and there have been attempts to portray Otley in particular as a sort of, as the father of the World Wide Web, of Wikipedia, but I'd want to place him, I think, in the context I've, where I've tried to situate him. And I think that's as a historically, geographically rooted figure uh, articulating a response to that age-old dream of the universal access to knowledge. And if there is an Otley legacy, it is, I think, for me, in a dream that's still alive, that's still with us, that dream was never going to be realised by three by five cards, by printed bibliographies, or even online catalogues. And I've often thought that with, you know, footfall in libraries, at least in, in the UK, and I imagine it's the same here, footfall in libraries is already falling 
And I think it really had no choice, no chance. Well, the idea of an international universal library really had no chance, even with this grand project of the Alexandria Library. This is the Bibliotheca Alexandrina with its beautiful building, pretty well on the site of where the ancient library of Alexandria stood and was destroyed at a time in antiquity that we're not quite sure about, uh, or why it actually came to be destroyed. But this library, this new library that was opened in 2002, had as an aspiration, of course an admirable aspiration, to serve as a two-way bridge between the traditions of Western scholarship and Islamic, the Islamic world, Islamic scholarship, and that's something that we must all welcome. But even ten years on, it's rather modest holding of books. I don't think it's exceeded two million books so far. That leaves it a long way short of a universal library, and it doesn't necessarily look to be the way forward. I don't think if we were planning a library now, I mean, an awful lot has happened with regard to sources, books, libraries, and so on since 2002. And I don't imagine we'd now be planning a library which gave a high priority, as the Alexandria Library did, to the provision of 2,000 seats for readers. But for a decade now, we've been sailing in the choppy waters of a universalist dream of a very different kind. And I refer, of course, to events since Google announced in 2004 that it planned to digitize 15 million printed volumes, four and a half billion pages, and to make them available online. Well, it was a breathtaking project, a breathtaking announcement. And it's no wonder, I think, that major academic libraries, Stanford, Michigan, Widener Library at Harvard, New York Public Library, and abroad, the Bodleian Library in Oxford, it's no wonder, I think, that the heads of these libraries signed up to make their holdings available for digitizing. And perhaps at last, truth and knowledge really would end up lying open to all. But less than a year into the project, and it was under pretty harsh scrutiny. Even the harshest critics agreed that Google deserved some credit for having made a start. If you take a rough expenditure, I mean, I don't know how you calculate that, but say you take a rough expenditure of, say, $50 a volume to digitize a volume, the project certainly implied uh, an expenditure, an investment, eventual investment of close to a billion dollars. So there was a certain sort of generosity there, and the money was indeed invested. And it has to be said that Google hasn't flagged that target of 15 million books, has in fact already been exceeded. But this is where the critics came in. 15 million items? Well, bear in mind the 130 million items that have been published since the 15th century. So we're talking about a digital library of barely a tenth of the world's output of books. Choices would necessarily be made, but who would choose? Google? maybe, but by what criteria? Perhaps commercial criteria. Perhaps uh, Google might favour titles that brought the most hits to the Google site. Or perhaps scholarly criteria on the other hand, but if so, what plans were there for consultation with potential users and the scholars themselves? And then there were problems over copyright. Google routinely disregarding authors' rights, publishers' rights, and there still is, I think, even to this day, an ongoing legal dispute between Google and the Authors Guild. And there's an ongoing problem of what are called orphan books. These are books that are still technically in copyright, but are out of print, unavailable, and in most cases the author is un either probably dead or uncontactable for uh, other reasons. Uh, then there were problems about the quality of the images, the job being done on the cheap by staff who didn't care and so on. Now all those points appeared in an incendiary book um, by Jean-Noël Janini, who was then the head of the French National Library, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. And the points he makes seem on the whole perfectly fair. They're the points that I've just summarised essentially. 
although I think they're made in the book, and I'd say that it was rather unhelpful to the cause, I think they were made in the book with a, a, a very strong dose of Gallic indignation, um, bordering sometimes on gratuitous venom, if I can put it that way. Jeanne's overriding concern was that question of choice. A choice, selection criteria, calculated as he saw it from the Latin Quarter, calculated, of course, to favour English books, and so to work against universal access, the universe outside Google, as he would have said, I'm sure, not being entirely Anglophone. Um, and that point would be forgotten. I mean, his, his whole thrust is that Google is going to be an Anglophone oriented, the Google project is going to be an Anglophone oriented project. And there, of course, you know, in a way, Genet has a point. And he certainly has a point, I think, in his concern about allowing a commercial enterprise to exercise a monopoly over so much of the world's printed heritage. I mean, where would, where would we, the users, be left? if Google lost interest or got into financial difficulties. Well, Janine's core point was that this is no place for a monopoly, it's no place for a purely business venture, it's no place for short-termism, it's no place for any venture that falls short of what he would see as the Enlightenment ideal of a free flow of ideas. Well, some of the uh, librarians who were seduced by the initial project had second thoughts. There's the case, I think, of Robert Darnton, the head of the Widener Library at Harvard. And uh, in Oxford, uh, it, well, I think everybody in Oxford in the Bodleian is so embarrassed by the whole thing, so you just don't mention it. You don't, no, just don't mention the Google, Google project, which I think is a pretty bad sign about embarrassment anyway. But it has, the whole attack on the Google project, I think, has... Been, has led to some constructive rethinking and stimulated other ventures. After a, a rather patchy start in 2008, a European project, the Europeana, got underway. This is a, a multinational platform with its administrative structure, headquarters in The Hague, and this has given access to books, archival documents, videos, recordings, museum objects in 27 countries across Europe. And the target is to have 30 million items, about a third of them books, accessible by 2015. And then of course barely three weeks ago the Digital Public Library of America was launched initially uh, with the idea of perhaps putting two, three million items uh, online, books, printed ephemera, archives, artefacts, and so on. Again, the same sort of profile, the same sort of range of items, and that these would be available digitally by, via distributed hubs that would give access to digitized items in the individual libraries and collections across the world. And so the model is the platform rather than the, uh, the central digitizing project. Now what's encouraging about these new ventures, I think, is that they are at least working together. And that you have the Europeana, the European project, and the Digital Library of America. You're getting, yet they're actually exchanging ideas, and in fact if you go into the uh, Digital Library of America site, you can very easily get access to the Europeana. And I think that's a whole new dimension, which is, is I think, must show the way forward. And I hope that eventually we'll get over this uh, gulf between Anglophones and non-Anglophones, uh, that sort of gulf, cultural gulf, linguistic gulf, that fired Jeanne's hostility to Google. So perhaps at last we're on a better track, well don't bet on it of course, uh, remember the enormity of the task, remember how long humanity has pursued the universalist ideal and remember poor Paul Otley, grotesquely underfinanced and just drowning under the sheer weight of his centralising enterprise. Now though I think we are using more promising techniques and I think both the uh, 
uh, Europeana and the Digital Public Library of America, I think they seen the value, above all, of distributing their efforts through portals and platforms that allow the burden of digitizing actually to be shared. The aim, though, on both sides of the Atlantic is freely available knowledge, truly public access, but there's obviously a long way to go, particularly on the funding front. The Library of Congress has been seen as a possible um, patron, foundations are being approached, but we've certainly not achieved, or the project has not achieved the, the funding that it really will need. Still, we may be on the right track. So with an eye on the subtitle of Jeannine's book, The Myth of Universal Knowledge, Perhaps Jeanne will be proved wrong for the very best of reasons. Perhaps we shall show that it is not a myth. Perhaps universal knowledge will prove not to be a myth after all. Well, we could only hope so. And in saying that, I have to say, I also think just how pleased Paul Otley would have been. Mm -hmm.